We will welcome uh, Sara Viana uh, from uh, the South African Institute of Aquatic Biodiversity in South Africa. Uh, so we look forward to your presentation, Sarah, and take notes so you can give some questions in the end. Uh, maybe especially the people who work at the Museum of Natural History here, because it's, it's going to be close by museums, the topic. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Welcome, Sarah. Give her a hand. Um, hi everybody, uh, thanks for the invitation here today, Michael and Fishbase and the Natural History Museum. I'm very glad to be here to talk a little bit about fish collections uh, and diversity of tropical deep sea elasma branch. Um, so um, when you talk with the general public about what you do for a living, and you say, um, oh, I do, I'm a marine biologist or I am an ichthyologist. They start to think about beautiful creatures like these ones and they start to imagine um, the deep ocean and how mysterious is that environment for their mind, right? How the creators are so uh, different and, and strange in morphology at the same time that uh, makes so curious to know what's really inside this environment. Um, however, when you start to explain to some people that actually you really uh, don't do diving in the deep ocean, you do another kind of research with the deep sea uh, fishes, um, they don't seem a little bit happy about it. And and then that's when we, you start to explain to them uh, what you really do and why you are in a museum, why you are in a building like this one doing your research. So here today I want to um, talk to you guys about the importance of the natural history collections for the improvement of the knowledge of the deep sea elasma branch in the tropics especially. And I'm going to take a, a close look on the Brazilian fish collections where I come from in Brazil. And some, uh, I'll make some comments also on the fish collections from South Africa where I'm based at the moment. So to start, I'm going to talk about the diversity of uh, chondrichians, the cartilaginous fishes. And so on, I'm going to give you some examples of how we can use the fish collections around the world to improve the knowledge that we have so far. So just a brief introduction about cartilaginous fishes. Uh, we have two subclasses, sub elasma branch and the holocephali. The chimeras represent only 4% of the total extant uh, species of the world, while sharks and the bad toad represent 42 and 53% of the total species. Um, the chondrichians are a very diverse group of fishes. Uh, they don't only inhabit, inhabit the marine realms, they also are able to, um, they were able to adapt to fresh water and to marine realms as well. And it's a kind of uh, group that is spread all over the world, it's very diverse. And um, at the moment, they, we have one, one of the greatest uh, number of species uh, in, in the world, especially in the tropics. Uh, one interesting point about uh, the cartilaginous species is that they are case-selected species. And that's very important to talk about uh, because case-selected species are those species that are they have some ecological traits and life history features that makes them vulnerable to any big environmental impact. Um, that can be, can be anthropic impact or not, right? Uh, some of these features uh, re uh, represent, uh, for example, the low fecundity, uh, the low growth rates of some species. Also, uh, they have long longevity of the, of the specimens, and that makes them really hard to recover, for example, from big environmental impacts 
just chat oil spills or temperatures variations. Um, so uh, the IUCN red list have categorized some uh, of the species of sharks, skates, and, and chimeras and rays uh, as threatened, near threatened, and extinct. And that's something that you really need to be aware about when we talk on um, deep sea species because nowadays uh, there is a, a big movement to explore the deep ocean for fisheries purpose. And now we need to monitor on how, how uh, good or, or bad the populations of sharks, skates, and rays, and chimeras are responding to these impacts, especially related to the fisheries. Um, but we have a problem here. Um, when we talk about deep sea elasma branch, for example, um, we see, according to the IUCN, that some of the species don't have data, enough data to be evaluated, to be assessed in the categories. And one of the major reasons to uh, the data deficient is that um, they don't know what species they are dealing with because they have taxonomical problems, they, people cannot identify them very well, they haven't been bi-coded yet, or some species has a long systematics and taxonomic history, and so on, they can't understand what's the name, the real name of the species and uh, how to separate them from each other. Um, that's just one example on uh, why uh, uh, taxonomy has to be done in order to make an assessment like this. Uh, another kind of assessment, another kind of problems that we have with the assessment is that we don't have life history of the species related to sharks and rays. Uh, only a few species has, has been uh, studied so far, so we need to improve that in order for them to be assessed and we move towards the conservation purpose. Um, so chondrichthys, like I said, they can, have, uh, can, they can be found uh, globally, but in the tropics they are very uh, well concentrated. Most of the species are in that region. Uh, of extinct species, and here is the a table with the number of species, deep water chondrichthyans, that has been found in different oceans. Uh, the Window West Pacific is the one with the highest number of species, uh, followed by the Western Atlantic and in the Eastern Atlantic Ocean. So, uh, for sharks and batoids, batoids include the skates and rays. We have a total of uh, 13 orders uh, so far, uh, four for batoids and, and 11 for, for sharks. And in every single um, orders, uh, we have at least one species that uh, uh, is, is living in the deep sea ocean. Uh, with one, f one few exceptions, but major, um, most of the orders, they have some representatives. Um, some of the uh, taxa, uh, they are um, um, uh, not temporarily a living species in the deep sea. They, they live most of their life history in the deep sea, and while orders uh, have more or less intermediary uh, uh, habitats between deep sea and more mesopelagic uh, areas. And uh, others, uh, they have even fewer and more restricted habitats to the coastal lines. Uh, only one order so far for some authors, they don't, they don't consider as a uh, taxa with deep sea uh, species, which is the heterodont forms. Um, so, for you to understand how the sharks and rays explore the deep sea, here is a table where I compiled from Wegeman 2016 uh, uh, with the depth range of most of the sharks and rays families. And as you can see, um, the majority of species in taxa, they don't explore the abyssal region. So, sometimes they they range really from the surface to down to 3,000 meters, but they don't go too far. 
And that's something that uh, we need to explore and to understand why the sharks and rays don't inhabit really deeper waters. Um, so, so far we have, for the diversity of deep sea in, uh, of, in the Condrictions, we have the Bigelow's skate as the, so, so far, the, the deepest uh, record with uh, over 4,000 meters depth, followed by uh, the Atmoris, Atmopterus princeps, the lantern sharks, and the Kukikara sharks with uh, 3,000 to 4,000 meters depth. And then the cameras. Um, so I'm just going to illustrate a little bit, very quickly, uh, the diversity of deep sea sharks and rays. Here's an example of coral sharks. It's a species that is distributed all over the world, as you can see. But sometimes they have a very uh, scattered distribution. So uh, and, and it's a rare uh, species sometimes. Uh, has been targeted in the fisheries and has been explored all over the world for shark, for shark meat and finning. Um, and these species, uh, particularly the blonde nose six gill shark, uh, uh, shows a vertical migration, which is something very uh, interesting because we don't know how it works, the kind of uh, movements on shark species. Um, for the other exanchiforms, we also have the frilled sharks, uh, also found globally. Uh, most, of, most of the specimen has been taken as bycatch in the fishery sector. Uh, the bramble sharks, uh, also um, most famous is the prickly shark, has a distribution in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, but very, it's a very rare species, for example, and, and it has been uh, also taken as by catch very heavily. The smaller sharks on the deep sea is one of the, that we call the pygmy shark. Uh, its um, maximum total length is reached like two two, over 260 millimeters only, so it's very small, very a tiny shark, and also has shown vertical migration. Um, a shark that has been recorded in many fisheries reports is the Cooper sharks. This, this species, um, although has been recorded so far in the fisheries records, is still data deficient due to uh, taxonomical problems because people don't know how to identify the area very well. They are still identified at least at genus level, like central frogs, SP, or something like that. But recent ch uh, change in the taxonomy uh, probably is going to change the assessment of this species soon. Uh, for the squaliforms, also uh, we have the sleeper sharks, and one of the examples is the long-nosed velvet dogfish. Uh, they only have three to nine pups per liter, which makes them very uh, vulnerable to overfishing, for example, and also has been targeted by, by catch. Uh, the soul sharks uh, also has uh, uh, shown uh, distributions in the deep ocean, and we have, for example, now a uh, species, the six gill soul sharks, that's endemic, endemic to the Western Indian Ocean, and that's even more uh, um, uh, something that we need to worry about because. In this region here, even though in South Africa the fishery uh, and man fishery management is so is very well uh, uh, um, regulated, we know that there's a lot of fishery trolls in that region that probably are making this species uh, vulnerable at the moment. Uh, also, that we have in the other kakahim forms, the cat sharks uh, that. Uh, uh, also are found in the deep ocean, for example, from 400 meters to 500 meters depth. This species particularly was described quite recently, and they were found in the Galapagos area, which is also endemic from that region. 
So far, this fish is because it's a new name, it's not ha has not been assessed, so it's not evaluated, and uh, uh, data about the biology of this species has to be done. The problem is that they were uh, described only on four, three to four specimens so far, so that makes it even harder to take any kind of data from the collection. Uh, for the um, pentakidi, pentakidi are known as the largest uh, uh, taxa family with the largest number of species uh, of deep sea sharks. And one example is the smaller eye cat shark. Um, they go down to 2,000 meters depth, and some of them, for example, these species were described from the southeastern Atlantic coast, but new records have show, sh shown up here in the North Atlantic, which means that we need to reevaluate if this is the same species or not. For the Haji forms, we have four families of deep sea skates. Um, one of them is the Gujasialide with the Abser skates. Uh, this this uh, species, for example, Monfi skates, is only found in the uh, southwestern Atlantic Ocean and also were described based only on a few specimens from the fish collections. You, uh, at the moment, it's as accessed as vulnerable. Um, for the leg skates, we have another example, the blue leg skates from the Western Australia, also data deficient. So far, we don't know any information about the biology of this species. And from the long tail skates, we have the Peruvian skate, also found in the Pacific and data deficient. So how are we gonna do taxonomic research related to the deep sea elasma branch in the tropics if we have so much few, uh, so, such a few number of specimens in the collections. In Brazil, for example, we don't have a his historical contribution to, to the deep sea research as some other countries. So basically, the research that we, we do is based on uh, specimens from the fish collection. The latest expedition that we had in Brazil was 20 years ago. And um, since then, no one has uh, taken a look into this material yet, until recently. So how are we going to do research with taxonomy in countries like Brazil and South Africa if we don't have such a big uh, funding or uh, deep sea research efforts? To understand that, we need to know a little bit more about the history of the taxonomy in these countries. So here I put two charts of uh, Brazil and Southern Africa that shows the contributions in terms of auto species, of nominal species, of elasmo branch, occurring in these two regions of the world. And we see that most of those species were described by earlier naturalists from the, the, from the 18th to the 19th centuries, the, the first expeditions to the New World. And the recent contributions has only been access uh, to a few local taxonomists, right? In the case for Brazil here, Carvalho, Gomes, and Miranda Ribeiro, the father of the Brazilian geology. And in Southern Africa to Campanho, Hurley and Smith, for example. So what's happening with this data? Is it really hard to access material in these two countries? Do they have a lot of material? Or it's only a matter of research funding that we don't have and people can carry on their work? Let's go more further into that. So here, um, also, uh, as you can see, is a table with uh, lists of the families of all chondrichians that were described from Brazil. And we see the freshwater rays are the, the taxa with the highest number of uh, spe species described from Brazil. Maybe because the access to freshwater uh, specimens easier, right? So people can go to the rivers and take them and study easy and then go to the deep ocean and do research there, maybe. But if you look to the battles related to the sharks, we see that the rays are by far the most studied group in Brazil. 
for example. Um, now, if we take a look more deeper in what the kind of uh, studies and what kind of group really uh, the, the researchers are targeting in the latest 20 years to compare with the history of taxonomy, we see that, yeah, Potamotigronidae, the fresh, fresh, uh, ray, freshwater rays, are the most studied group, right? While the deep sea chondrichthyes like the chimeras, the skates, only represent 1% to 2% of the study in the latest 20 years. So that's very low. Now, what is really happening in these cases? Um, I think uh, sometimes it's uh, just lack of scientific interest because the sharks and rays uh, from the deep sea are not very charismatic. Sometimes they're too small to work on, or they're not very funny in some way. Uh, but also is a funding problem. Uh, or is just a lack of making taxonomy popular to the to the to everyone, including uh, uh, um, uh, conservationists and students from schools and so on. So that's pretty sad. What we can do then? How we can do that to to uh, address the taxonomic impediment in these cases? I'm going to show you now uh, some study that I have done with, uh, based on the specimens from the fish collections around the world. And one of the most difficult taxa is the genus Squalus, which is one of uh, the dogfish sharks, are the genus that's found everywhere in the world. And uh, the problem with the genus is that the species are so similar to each other that it's hard to identify. Uh, but I think the good things about it is that in the latest 10 years, there was lots of investments in, in taxonomies of the genus, so we clarify a lot of the nomenclature and the problems with the identification using morphological and molecular data. Uh, so when I done that, I done uh, through my PhD, and I, have, I was able to travel around the world to see all the fish collections and all the specimens they, 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 they had available. So for Gibb, for example, we have, at the moment, over 4,000 records only for the dogfishes in the fish collections of the world. So that's a lot of material. And uh, in my case, for my PhD, I didn't apply molecular. I only apply morphological characters to separate species. And we have some good results with some new species that came out from that. Only exclusively, exclusively uh, using specimens from fish collections in the world. Now, another, um, a new, uh, more recent case here of, the, of research with taxonomy is the deep water skates. These uh, two species were described only on few, uh, uh, based on few specimens, three to four specimens in the whole world. Uh, the, the species of Kamejay hemistra is a species that occurs in the Western Indian Ocean together with Kamejay onata. Onata was described recently, uh, and the major difference between them were clasper morphology because and in a few coloration, because some of the, for the ornata, there is no rosettes available in the dorsal side, and for the, for the hemistra, they do have. But uh, recently, we caught two new specimens collected in the Western Indian Ocean that represent an intermediary between these two species. So how are we going to sort it out? Which, which species they belong to? And we have an even uh, worse case here because we don't have molecular tissue sample available for this new specimen. So we cannot test it, uh, how to identify this species made of molecular data. However, we have over 700 records in the fish collections in the world that we can use as comparative data to try to clarify this information on these two species. And another good thing about it is that they were known as deep water skates, but the new specimen was collected right in 30 meters depth only. So that's something that 
we can uh, be aware of how these this, this species are distributed throughout the Western Indian Ocean. What's the movement part? What, what they do in such shallow waters? Are they uh, temporarily in that region or they really deep water skates? Another example is uh, for the gopher sharks, the long-nosed dogfishes. That's a very uh, recent work that I'm still uh, uh, doing it at the moment. So the genus Dania uh, occurs um, also worldwide, but with very scattered distribution. Uh, we have so far four species, and three of them are found in the western Indian Ocean and southeast Atlantic Ocean. The problem here is that Dinia quadrispinosa has been recorded in that region, but uh, the DNA analysis probably is going to show us that it might be an undescribed species or something else. Uh, now, using a new, uh, new collected material from the Madagascar, we also uh, could find that difference in the coloration could support this hypothesis. And then we're going to go further into that to see if we have the Quadrispinosa, which is a species described from, Western, uh, from Australia, uh, in the Western Indian Ocean, or it's just a misidentification. In this case, here we have 48 records only for the Western Indian Ocean throughout the fish collections in the world. Um, in another particular case where we can apply uh, fish collections to clarify taxonomic problems is with the roe sharks. The roe sharks are a very small group of sharks with only five species in the world. Uh, one of them is Oxynotus centrina, which was this originally described from the Mediterranean region. This species has been recorded all over the Eastern Atlantic Ocean. But we also found a new specimen in the, in, a new specimen in the Western Indian Ocean, only one. And this particular one specimen has shown completely different patterns of uh, morphology in the fins and coloration and also some um, morphological features in the mouth. Uh, now, we only have this single specimen, but we are pretty sure that if we, found, if we find more specimens in the region, probably could indicate that this species it doesn't occur in the Western Indian Ocean. So then we can go further in the um, uh, taxonomic, try to sort it out the taxonomic problem to see if this is a new species or it is a um, nominal this species that has been forgotten in the past. Now, uh, uh, what's the, what's the, hello, right, okay. Um, so as you can see uh, throughout these examples, uh, no matter if you have thousands of specimens in a fish collection or you only have one of that species in a fish collection, every single natural history collection has a contribution to sort it out uh, problems related to taxonomy. And now I'm going to show you that uh, the natural history collections also can prove uh, not only biodiversity knowledge related to taxonomy, but also to other fields of biology. So for you to understand that the, the natural history collection has a bigger and a more important meaning for us related to conservation of the species, especially related to deep sea species that has been overfished lately. So, why natural history collections? When you think about natural history collection, you automatically think about taxonomy. But the data that we have inside these collections go even further into that. For example, we can manage to see the response of population of deep sea species to ecological, to climate change, I mean, to climate change over time, if you have a good set of data throughout the ears. Also, we can investigate based on museum specimens the trophic levels, uh, trophic ecology of some populations, some species. Also, we can do, for example, um, studies on reprodu reprodu reproductive biology 
to know how many pups they have, how long the, gestation, the gestation period it is, just by using fish uh, specimens from the natural fish collections. And with all this data put it together, we can finally contribute towards the conservation of some of these species, right? Now, um, I don't know if you have heard about this. Uh, this is a picture of the, uh, the Museum of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil that got to fire last month. Um, that was 200, year, 200 years of historical records that got burned. Uh, this is a, a high-impact picture of that sad Sunday that everything happened, everything got burned, the, the building went down. We lost most of the data, that the data all the historical uh, data we lost, especially related to, to fossil records, many invertebrate, marine deep sea invertebrates as well, and uh, reptiles. Basically, most of the collection of uh, the entomology section as well. So it was something pretty bad. 200 years that they were celebrating this year were lost. Luckily, the fish collection is safe. It's not, it wasn't in this building. It was in an excess building. So they still have uh, material there if you guys are interested. Um, but uh, this picture here just is illustrate at the moment uh, how bad it is to do research with the deep sea species in countries like Brazil, for example. Um, and just to uh, try to open a discussion about it and maybe may make the uh, funding agents aware of how, how we can do to make it better countries like Brazil related to the biodiversity data, I'll, I'll introduce to you here some of the paths that we can do in order to do a better, a better way to do more, more than systematics in Brazil, for example. So research funding, that's the first thing, right? We all need money to carry on our research. Um, by that, we can guarantee permanent experts, right? And also fund the scientific expeditions, because without the scientific expeditions, we cannot get new data to move on towards the studies, right? And that way, you can strengthen your research. You can recruit new collaborators. It doesn't matter if it's going to be international or national research. So you can always collaborate with more data if you get involved. Um, another point is to focus on the deep sea. Brazil at the moment is one of the, I th there was a study recently in 2000, I think early this year, um, that Brazil is one of the uh, f um, first uh, countries, m one of the first countries to export shark meat, for example. So we need to know what exactly we are exporting and who are these species, what are they? We need to know what is going on. So why not to focus on deep sea and non charismatic taxa like them? In order to do that, we need to improve, modernize our museums, right? And by that, also modernize our bioinformatics data because anyone can be uh, accessing the data from anywhere in the world. And by that, you, you're going to uh, speed up the actions of, of certain problems that you, you need to do to improve biodiversity knowledge. And they implement some DNA backcoding uh, back projects and biobanks. I believe that uh, if we follow these steps, doesn't matter where you come from, if you're from Brazil, if you're from South Africa, you're probably going to boost new outcomes for the modern systematics very, very quickly. And then the most important is to make people aware that um, why we do research in, in the fish collections, why there are still people using those old specimens to, to do research for living. Why are they doing that? Just because 
they they funny or something? No, it's even more than that. Um, I think that picture. Let me just go back. Here is also also illustrate that because in Latin America in general, the uh, public, um, non-academic public, they don't know the idea what science is, what's um, um, what's what's being a researcher. So if we go through all these steps, we will guarantee that the general public will know what science, will we'll know what's a fish, will know why they're taking the, te the money from their taxes, right, and putting this museum. Because so far, the Brazilian population, they don't know the importance of this building. Most of them, they don't know why it was so sad to see this picture, right? So I believe doing that, we're going to guarantee this is going to change with the time. So thank you so much uh, for being here today. I would like to say thank you to the South African, Muse uh, South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity for the support, Fish Base, and the Natural History Museum here in Stockholm. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Uh, but the good thing about the Nancy project is that they always have a commitment to stop all of the trajectory, and in this stop, they already take the specimens and they put in the local fish collection of that specific country. So they don't carry on big specimens like that for so long, you know. So maybe it's just one idea that can be applied to other places to make a, a collaboration between the countries that has been, will be researchers and you can deposit the specimen there and you know, don't throw them away. Now, related to, yeah, uh, to if we need more specimens, yeah, of course we need. Some, some species are really rare. For example, uh, like I said, the roe sharks, they were described as only one or two specimens. So the more, the better, especially now with the DNA uh, data available for, for inferring the species delimitation and phylogeny. If we have tissue samples associated to voucher specimens, that would be great. Maybe with the time, maybe in 50 years' time, we can do a re-evaluation of all the historical phylogeny and you know, so on, for definitely. Any more questions from the audience? Uh, you mentioned, uh, Sarah, the, um, uh, you said, firstly, that uh, sharks in this depth are not so charismatic. Um, is that a symptomatic uh, thing within research, that <laughs> charismatic species will get a lot of researchers and non-charismatic species will have very low attention? Yeah, related to sharks and rays, I think it's a little bit um, contradictory, uh, the situation, because if you talk to a kid, for example, they will love to talk about sharks. They will be so curious to know better about them. Uh, but at the same time, if you talk about skate, they'll, they'll say, mm, boring, flat fish, something like that, you know? So I don't know, it's something maybe related to the whole figure for everyone that gets you know, more uh, um, curious about them. But uh, I agree with you in terms of uh, academic funding. Uh, I think it's uh, something generalized. Uh, let's say, let's talk about shark. The white shark, for example, is a charismatic species, even though it's not so charismatic. <laughs> but it got lots of funding for research on white sharks, you see. Uh, at the same time, for deep sea sharks like the dogfish, we don't have much related to anything. Even population genetics, phylogeography, we don't have anything related to that. For white sharks, every, everything basically has been done. So, Yeah, that is actually something we realize in WWF as well. If you talk about charismatic species, people are very willing to help. If you talk about very important species, but not so charismatic, it's uh, less attention in, uh, in the public. So maybe we have to communicate it in a different way. My last question, you mentioned the export of shark meat. And I was in a, in a small seminar two weeks ago where it showed on the map that, yes, Brazil is exporting a lot. Yeah. Uh, also, Asia is exporting a lot. And two areas that is importing a lot of shark meat is Europe and South America. Do you have any comments on that? Um, actually, it's a really good point of view because, for example, for me, I'm, I'm from the northeast region of Brazil, which is one of the poorest regions of the whole country. And uh, it's pretty common for some people to eat, eat shark meat, meat in the um, small fishing communities. But the problem in this specific case is that these communities, they don't know the difference between a shark and a common, a vulgar name that we call a shark, that like is a, a name, Cassão. They think it's a completely different thing. They think it's shark is just those big animals with lots of the teeth, you know. But if they see a small shark like this, they call it something completely different. And they treat as a teleost fish for, for eating, you know, for food. That's one of the problems. So uh, just for everybody to realize how the education has to be addressed in these this terms as well in South America in order to maybe, you know, uh, tell people that it's, that species is very important. They can just eat like that. Uh, 
Yeah, and yeah. I think it's an important education for all of you to bring to your friends that if it only says uh, fish, you have to observe what's in there because shark is not uh, traceable, traceable as much as other fish because we don't use it as obvious as we do with other fish like white fish for food. Okay, a last chance for a question from the audience. We thank you very much, Sarah. Thank it was you. a very interesting presentation. Thank you.